Hello. Uh, today we're here under the auspices of the annual reviews of chemical and biomolecular engineering. I'm uh, Elton Cairns, professor of chemical engineering at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, we're going to have a conversation today with Professor Adam Heller of the <clears throat> University of Texas at Austin in the chemical engineering department. Professor Heller is very well known as a scientist, uh, inventor, and entrepreneur. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, with him today to hear more about his uh, highly varied and very interesting and exciting uh, career in these various uh, fields. So, uh, Adam, can you tell us a little bit about the, um, your early years and the development of your interest in uh, science and research? So, I was born in Cluj, Romania in 1933. A pretty well-to-do family. My father was a textile merchant. And he and his partner had a, one of the biggest stores in that part of the world, known as Transylvania. We had a fairly happy childhood and fairly happy family. When I was nine years old, my father was taken to slave labor by the Hungarians, sent to the Ukraine under horrible conditions where only one out of six people survived. I could tell during this interview a lot about his suffering. When I was 11, we were deprived of all of our property. Schools were closed. We were incarcerated under inhuman conditions in a brick factory where my father was twice so badly beaten that he was carried out of these breathings in a stretcher. We stayed in brick sheds. There were 18,000 people in those, where the Hungarians who ran the camp had one single business, loading them onto cattle wagons and sending them for gassing in the German concentration camp of Auschwitz. What an experience. Was your family allowed to stay together? My father had a friend and he succeeded in convincing the Nazis that we are some value and they can get some money for us. And we, along with 380 Jews, were not shipped to Auschwitz but to Budapest and then there were negotiations on whether we should be sent or gassing or whether we should be sold. Unfortunately, we were not sent to gassing, but we were sent to another German concentration camp, Bergen-Belsen, where the negotiations continued. So who would, who as would the, pay the money? As the end of the war approached in December 44, the price dropped. And because the price dropped, <laughs> We were released to Switzerland at a lower price. Presumably, there were some monies changing hands coming from the American Joint, just the Joint Jewish Distribution Committee, and they were presumably in the shape of tractors that were given to the Germans. It's a long story, and several books were written about it. So anyway, in December of '44, when I was 11 years old, we arrived in Switzerland, we got some clothing, we got some food. I was emaciated, I lost about half my weight. And we continued in the fall of 1945 to Palestine. I was on a ship carrier, on a troop carrier that returned troops from the war to Australia and New Zealand. And they dropped my family and me off in the port of Haifa. So I arrived in Israel, what's now Israel, what was at the time Palestine, in the fall of 45, and that's where I got my education. So how much time did you miss from school as a result of all of this? Well, the first place I came to in Israel was a kibbutz in the northern, in northern Israel. 
they put me in sixth grade, although in Hungary I completed only half of the fifth. Then I rejoined my parents in the outskirts of Tel Aviv. They allowed me to skip seventh grade and went straight into eighth grade, and I caught up with the children of my age group. Then I went to a wonderful high school where I got all the physics foundation and chemistry foundation. So at this point, was this the beginnings of your intense interest in Absolutely, science? absolutely. I had absolutely great teachers there who worked for practically nothing. Later I found out that the school was so poor that they couldn't even pay their paid teachers. Then I went to, like all the young Israelis, to serve in the Israeli army. And at the time, I was interested in a medical career. When I was in boot camp and they learned that I want to be a physician, they sent me to the medical corps to work in the pathology institute of a military hospital. And there I very quickly discovered that at the time, medicine was not yet science. And I saw being in the, in the Pathology Institute, mistakes. And I decided that I'd rather be a scientist working towards better medicine. At the same time, I was applied to and I was admitted to the Science Corps of the Israeli Army. And that allowed me to go and study at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And initially I wanted to study biochemistry, but very quickly I found out that this foundation of biochemistry is really chemistry. And then I found out that for chemistry I need physical chemistry, and for physical chemistry I need physics, and for physics I need mathematics. So I studied all of the above. Eventually, I wrote at the Weizmann Institute a first master's thesis in chemical kinetics with a great physical chemist, Ernie Grunwald, who was on a sabbatical where people don't drive on the right side of the road. And he didn't look at the traffic coming, and he arrived in his ear with his arms and his legs, legs broken. So I was the arms and the legs of Ernie Grunwald, and it couldn't have been a better experience so of learning have, physical chemistry. You must have developed a very close relationship with him. Indeed, exceptionally close, exceptionally close. He taught me how to analyze results, how to measure, how to pose a question, how to answer it. It was an exceptional experience. He was sitting in a chair with his arms and his legs in a cast, and I was executing his work. What a way to learn. <laughs> a very, very unusual opportunity and to some degree burden. I wrote my master's thesis, but there was some jealousy. The Hebrew University didn't want to recognize a master's thesis that was done at the Weizmann Institute. So they didn't accept it. I went to my organic chemistry professor, and David Bergman, and he says, no problem. I like your thesis, and you will just work with me for a little while, and this will be part of your PhD thesis. So I became the student of Ernst David Bergman. And Ernst David Bergman one of the, was one of the greatest scientists and engineers of Israel. The Weizmann Institute has a chemistry building named after him. The Israeli Weapons Development Authority has its major facility named after him. He worked very closely with the David Ben-Gurion, who was the first prime minister. He was also the founding director of the Weizmann Institute. And what I learned from Bergman is something that at the time was not acknowledged, that there is no boundary between good fundamental research and good applied research and engineering. 
the boundaries don't exist. You have a continuum, you do one well, you do the others well. At the time, the notion was that there is such a thing as fundamental research that stands on its own, and there is applied research that's aimed at products and services, but of course we know that the boundaries don't exist. Unfortunately, but, that view is still somewhat popular around the world. In some places, my opinion is that there is nothing but nothing that's more important than uncovering a new truth in science or in engineering. The next best thing that I can do is create a product or a service that serves people. The next best thing that I can do is educate people who can do one of these two things. The next best thing that I can do is to provide data for those people who can use them to uncover new truth or to create new products. And I have a pretty poor opinion of people who say that they work on applied science and are looking for customers for their science. So I guess it was around this time of your graduate work that uh, you met your lovely wife, Ilana. Can you Indeed. tell us a little about Indeed. that? In the second year of my studies, when we were in the biochemistry class, and that's where I got to know her. I also was her commanding officer for a while, in the summers and in the weekends when we were training, and I was fortunate to meet her. So how many years have you been married now? I met her in 1953, I believe, and so we have known each other for 61 years. We have mar been married for 58 years. 58 years. That's, that's an enviable situation. So uh, after you finished your studies in Israel, can you tell us about your early career following your graduate studies? Well, uh, let me go back that Bergman very much believed at the time that other than performing experiments, one can also calculate. You can derive properties, you can derive direction, reaction rates, you can derive mathematically synthetic roots. And one of the best centers for computational chemistry was in Paris. So he sent me for a year to work with Bernard Pullman at the University of Paris where I did such work. And immediately after I got my PhD, I put my knowledge to use. I knew some computational chemistry, I knew synthetic chemistry, I knew physical chemistry, and used these to develop organic liquid scintillators for fast nuclear counting. I got a patent on these, published five papers, most of them in Journal of Chemical Physics, and sold the patent to nuclear enterprises in Scotland. And this provided Ilana and me much, much needed money because we were exceptionally poor at the time. Now, in 1958, our first child was born. That was three years before I completed my PhD thesis. Ilana was working on her PhD thesis. By the way, when I was in Paris, Ilana was with me working at the Institut Pasteur with Jean Dosset, who later got a Nobel Prize. So Ilana was a pretty good scientist on her own. But in 58, her first child, a daughter, was born and she was misdiagnosed terribly. She was sick. She didn't have valves in her urinary system and she was diagnosed as being allergic to cow's milk, to milk. Because of the misdiagnosis, she developed terribly high fevers, went into conversions, was treated with dihydromycetstreptomycin, and this made her deaf. It also damaged her brain. We didn't know about her missing urinary valves until much later, until we came to the United States. And initially, we were told in Israel that she is retarded. Later, it was discovered in Israel that she is deaf. And 
Hi, Ilana and I came to Berkeley as I was a postdoc to work with Andy Streitweiser in 1962 because at the time Andy Streitweiser was doing theoretical chemistry and I thought that I can do better computational theoretical chemistry with Andy than I have done in Paris. So I guess I just missed you at Berkeley. I, I graduated just before you arrived <laughs> for your postdoc. <laughs> we published a paper with Andy on computational chemistry, but my main conclusion at the time was that I'm getting back in numerical form my hypothesis. And I very quickly, while still at Berkeley, switched to working on plasma chemistry with Andy. This was 1963 now. The first lasers came out. They were Maiman's solid-state laser and Townsend Shallow had the gas masers and lasers. Liquid lasers didn't exist. And I started spreading the word based on my work on liquid scintillators that I know how to make a liquid laser. And somebody somehow heard about it at Bell Laboratories. That was at the time the mecca of science and engineering, particularly in anything that has to do with electronics and communication. And I got a phone call from a colleague at Bell Labs asking me, are you spreading the word that you know how to make a liquid laser? And I say, yes. <laughs> Pretty soon I have a couple of colleagues from Bell Labs interviewing me and I get a job offer as a postdoc in Maria Hill, New Jersey to work on liquid lasers. And I start working there in the department of Stretch Winslow with Ed Wasserman. And very quickly I understand the principles. The principle was we didn't have liquid lasers because people try to make liquid lasers in solvents like water and alcohol and acetic acid, all of which had protons. But because they had protons, they had high frequency vibrations. The high frequency vibrations coupled with the excited electronic state states and there was flow of electronic energy to the vibrations. I showed this while still at Bell Labs by taking neodymium that at the time was delazing iron. It was lazing in glasses, it was lazing in solids, dissolving it in water, measuring a quantum efficiency of 10 to the minus 6, putting it in D2O and increasing the quantum efficiency by three orders of magnitude. Not good enough, but substantial. Before you got rid of the protons? At the time, this was now 64, my daughter needed a school in New York. She had to go to the Lexington School for the Deaf. I had to look for a job in New York. I went to work for GT Laboratories in Bayside, New York. And it was there that I worked, built the first neodymium liquid lasers. And on that, you had the greatest exposure you could have had, you could imagine. It was written up by all newspapers, all magazines, and so on. The American Institute of Physics had a press release on it, and so on. Oh, it was a big deal. It was a big deal at the time, in 1964. And I guess that was... Just before we actually met, I think what, you were at GTE when we exactly. first met. Exactly. Now, the solvent that I used was selenium oxychloride. And then we went to phosphorus oxychloride. And we tried to dry the phosphorus oxychloride to remove all the hydrogen that's present there as hydrogen bound to the oxygen, try to get out, to get it out of hydrogen, hydrochloric acid. And in desperation, I added sodium, expect, expecting it to blow up <laughs> to the <laughs> phosphorus oxychloride, <laughs> because sulfur sodium was at the time the best drying agent yes. to remove hydrogen chloride. Well, it sat there very quietly and didn't do anything it developed a passivating layer. Wow. 
serpent because it developed a passivating layer. I asked, maybe I can make a lithium chlorine battery and a sodium chlorine battery. So I electrolyzed sodium chloride as the as a salt. I made the sodium tetrachloro tetrafluoroborate and other salts. And look and behold, I made sodium chlorine and lithium chlorine batteries, and that's because you were deeply involved, you were the guru at the time of yes, these so batteries. That's the way we met. Remember your and, visit to Argonne National Lab. And I remember, I think this we, we met, didn't we, in Stockholm at an ISC meeting? Yes, yes. And it was at this ISC meeting that you invited me per, to visit Argonne. Yes. Now, Nobody at the time believed me that you can make a practical battery of enoxyhalide and lithium or sodium. I went from agency to agency, no takers. <laughs> there were no takers. Well, it was a far out idea at the time. There was one exception. At the Office of Naval Research, there was an acting director of chemistry. His name was Harry Fox. I remember that name. And Harry Fox invites me to come to see him in Washington and listens to me without saying anything for about 30 minutes. And then he said, write for me a proposal, no longer than four pages, double-spaced. Did you hear me? <laughs> I wouldn't hear that now. <laughs> So I wrote a proposal, not longer than four pages, double-spaced, and he gave me $25,000. The $25,000 was substantial, but it wasn't terribly much. But it was enough for my management at GT Laboratories to be convinced that there is something there, because until then they wouldn't support it at all. Based on those $25,000 with those, I hired Jim Auburn. And Jim Auburn, being the great scientist and engineer he is, looks at the system, and takes chlorine, bubbles it into the phosphorus oxychloride, measures quantitatively how much chlorine there is, puts in it a lithium electrode, and look and behold, derives far, far, far more coulombs than he could from the amount of chlorine that he added. The capacity greatly exceeded the, the amount of added chlorine. So, of course, there was another reaction going so on. So, he very quickly discovered that we were reducing the phosphorus oxychloride. Then he looked at other oxychlorides and we came up with the lithium thionyl chloride battery, which was the first most important product that we put into production. That was in 1972. So this, of course, had all kinds of defense applications. It went into defense applications, medical applications, computer applications, and it became produced just about in by all major battery manufacturers of the world. And what's so gratifying that Did today... Did GTE hold the patents on this? Uh, GTE tried to get into patents, but Blomgren at United Car Union, Union Carbide at the time had an experiment where he dissolved in nitrobenzene a thionyl chloride and he discharged it and it had it in notebook. So patents went in part to Blomgren and part to GT. We wrote the first papers because he had nothing to publish. And wasn't the Army Laboratories near Washington, uh, D.C. Absolutely, also absolutely. They gave us there? money for this work. 
And when we reported it, they got it very much involved in it very quickly. Exactly so. The people who funded us, they also did it. So there is a paper that they published just after us immediately. So it was a very, very active field at that time. Became, became very, 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 very active. What's gratifying is that today, after 42 years, the battery is still in production. And it's still used mostly now in those applications where you need a very long life. It has a shelf life now proven to be 20 years. You need a huge energy density. It has the highest. So it has a very unique combination of characteristics that no other battery can match. And that's why it is still being used. Soon after, in 1970, my daughter no longer needed the school in New York and we moved to Massachusetts. There we did an experiment. We said, well, if there is no radiationless relaxation, energy doesn't flow from excited ions to vibrations of the solvent, then maybe we can have electrochemical reactions that emit light in these solutions. And indeed, very quickly we found that all of the rare earths electroluminous. But that's not, that wasn't important. What was important, that my colleague Heinz Gerischer was also in, in Germany at the time the director of the Fritz Haber Institute, was also interested in electroluminescence and came to visit us in Massachusetts and spent with us a few days. And this was just a short time after the Arab oil embargo in 1973. And he were teaching me the elements of semiconductor electrochemistry and telling me that we can make a semiconductor liquid junction solar cell. Uh, at GTE, I couldn't do much work on this. My responsibilities were totally different. Lighting, mostly lighting related. But a year later, my, in 75, my daughter no longer needed the school in Massachusetts. So I could return to Bell Laboratories. And then I really started to work seriously on the semiconductor liquid junction solar cells. And over five years, we published papers on efficient, more than 10% efficient yeah, solar I cells. I remember that work very well. During this time, did you maintain your uh, connection with, uh, with Heinz and collaborate on the semiconductor work? I came to Berkeley and gave several seminars. Charlie Tobias invited me yes. at the time. By 1981, after we made efficiently hydrogen and after we converted sunlight efficiently, I recognized that in the practical sense, we cannot compete with the silicon PN junction solar cells. No way, because there are assembly costs ceiling costs that are inevitable. It's much more expensive. And because I saw that I can't help society, I quit. <laughs> so what came next? Now, I became at the time a manager. My laboratories decided that I should have a small but exquisitely great organization called the Electronic Materials Research Department. If you ask me, what's the claim to fame of the Electronic Materials Research Department? The claim to fame was my colleague, King El Tai. King El Tai was a person who was absolutely unique. He came to the United States without any education, worked as a lab technician, worked as a junior scientist, and eventually, before 
well before he retired. He was one of the Bell Labs fellows, of whom there were over the history of the Bell Laboratories about 100. And what King did, and what I helped him do, was build the technology of the dense interconnection of silicon chips. How do you connect an array of silicon chips so that they talk to each other rapidly and in an integrated way? How do you transmit rapidly information from chip to chip? This required multi-layer metallizations, multi-layer interconnections, and a totally new world of materials technology, including the flip chip technology, where you made a thousand solder points simultaneously. And my job was not to interfere with his wonderful work, but to assist him, to promote him, to, add, to, to coordinate it. I also had there other colleagues like George Seller and Bob Fry, who worked on high-voltage silicon chips, laser annealing, silicon and silicon, all came out of our department. Now, it was the culture of Bell Laboratories that other than being a manager, you continue to work as a scientist and engineer on your project, not on somebody else's in your department. Yes. You are not their bosses. You are their boss when it comes to administration and helping them. You are not their competitor. You are not telling them what to do. Being head of the Electronic Materials Research Department, I was reading the literature, and one of my jobs was to track superconducting computers. And I see a paper by two electrochemists whom you probably know, John Albury and Phil Bartlett, saying that there is an enzyme called glucose oxidase, a protein. It's a thick protein shell, and when they take an organic metal, they can tunnel electrons from the metal to a deep redox center in the protein while removed from the metal. Now, we knew that tunneling beyond a few angstroms is exceptionally slow. Low probability event. Terribly low. So I started to look into it, and with my postdoc, Yedanda Ghani, I quickly established that the organic metal dissolved, and it's, it was it, reacting and decorating the protein with redox centers. So then we took the enzyme, bound to it redox centers, to the protein, we opened the protein, bound to it redox centers, and look and behold, it worked. We, could, we could tunnel electrons back and forth by multiple hops, like from redox center to redox center. Wow! Ephraim, my son, was at the time at Yale School of Management. Earlier, he got his first his degree from Harvard in theoretical physics, worked for a management consulting company, and was now in Yale School of Management. And he decided that, that he's going to look into what you can use the con electrical connection between enzymes and circuits for. And he quickly came up and saying, well, diabetes management, where we need to monitor glucose concentrations. So of course that could have a huge impact. So many no. people are afflicted with diabetes. We'll come to that. So this was now 1987, 98, and however much I loved Bell Laboratories, I knew that this work needs to be done at a university. 
was, I really loved my laboratories. I never worked with such fine people in my life and never ever will again as those at my laboratories. So it was a unique laboratory. I got myself a job at the University of Texas at Austin. And this was a big decision, very, very big change in your professional life. Indeed, indeed. And my colleagues at my laboratories were kind enough to keep my position open for more than a year. And after a year, Alcho, who was my boss, asked me, will you come back? And I said, no. And until then, I was going every month for a week back to Bell Laboratories to work there for a week. And then I stayed at UT. And at UT, we did perhaps the most important thing that helps people, and that was to develop redox hydrogels that were the only known electron conducting aqueous phase in which glucose dissolves, in which the enzymes are dissolving, bound, and where we could get a material that we could coat on the electrode for the transduction of a biochemical flux to an electrical current. Yes. Let me jump to September this year. Based on the electrical connection, Ephraim and I founded a venture called TerraSense. TerraSense came out with a series of products which we will discuss. But the latest product of TerraSense, based on our electrical connection of enzymes to circuit, came out in Europe two months ago. It's a dollar-sized coin that has a needle that you stick into yourself and pull out, leaving behind a polymer strip that you don't feel. It's only 0.2 millimeters thick, and it's only two millimeters wide and five millimeters long. So this adheres to your skin? No, no, it's in the skin. Oh, it's in the skin. It's in the skin. And in the coin, you have an amplifier transmitter such that if you swipe it with a device that looks like a cell phone, you get your glucose reading and you get your history of eight hours and you don't have to calibrate it, you don't need to draw blood anymore. You use it for two weeks between replacements. That's a uh, Abbott that bought TerraSense underestimated how fast people will want it and how much. So they couldn't make it fast enough? No, it, as of last week, they no longer take customers. Those that already bought it, they supply, and now they are building up the production again. <laughs> That's incredible. What so considering that it replaces 16 billion blood withdrawals annually, it's quite important. It's amazing. So let's go back to 1988. We come to the University of Texas, we build the technology for electric connect, electrically connecting enzymes to circuits to redox hydrogels. So we who, called it who owns the patents on this? The university. The but University some of, of your Texas. Work started at Bell Labs, right? Do no. they have a patent no. interest? At Bell Labs we decorated soluble enzymes, but the hydrogels with the redox centers. That came later. That came later okay. and that's what that was necessary because the enzymes were still soluble. Mm -hmm. So now the redox centers are not in the enzyme. The redox centers are now part of a hydrogel, the polymer network of a hydrogel. Okay. And the reason that you they couple with the enzyme is the enzyme is a polyanion and the, pol the hydrogel is a polycation. So they stick together. Sure. And they couple electronically. And there's these other patents of UT, 
which were acquired by Terrasens and became the foundation of Abbott Diabetes Care. So now Abbott owns the patents or licenses the patents? Yeah, both. Both Abbott oh, licensed exclusively the patents. So Terrasens and Abbott licensed and, and then also owns many of the patents because over the years I continue to consult to Terrasens and then, then to Abbott. And I always wanted to make it very smooth that there will never be a fight and the relations will be harmonious. And if Rhyme negotiated a deal, the university was paid a royalty irrespective of where the product was developed. So let me now talk about Terrasens. So the first thing that we want to do is exactly this device that I just described. But the venture capitalists say it's too risky. So if Rhyme, my son, decides that what he will switch to, that was his idea, is a finger stick like sensor, but requiring at least 10 times less blood than any existing sensor at the time. So people were pricking their fingers, getting large blood drops. It was painful, took a strip, touched it, got a blood sample, measured their glycemia, their glucose, blood glucose concentration. 5% uh, of the people of the world are diabetic. 1% of the people need to need these measurements. If they don't do it, they go blind, they lose their kidneys, they develop neuropathy, they, their legs are amputated. It's a horrible disease if they don't monitor. He observed, the Ephraim observed, that if he pricks his skin in the arm, he can get a much smaller sample of blood. From the finger, you get a big sample. From your arm, you get a much smaller one. But it doesn't hurt. So he came to me and asked, can we make a sensor for such a small sample of blood? I knew that it can be done if I use a small enough microelectrode, yes, micro but I would get an extremely yes. small current yes. and I will need expensive electronics. The other alternative was not to do an amperometric measurement, where I could for a while get a steady current, but to do a coulometric measurement. And if I have a coulometric measurement, then I can oxidize all the glucose. If I have a small sample, it works to my advantage. We recruited and with some wonderful people and Ben Feldman at Terrasense and the Net Abbott Diabetes Care actually developed this microcoulometer and my colleague Phil Planter made it manufactured. And that was the product that the first, that after four years, the company put on the market and increased its market value to $1.2 billion, which Abbott paid it's for the company. It's spectacular growth for Theracents. But the other thing that Abbott paid for, we had all the time in development, the continuous glucose monitor based on the wired enzyme. Coulometer measurement had nothing to do with wired enzymes. Mm -hmm. It has to do with sophisticated electrodes and the mediators, which we can discuss, but that's not so important. We had to put on the low burner the continuous monitor, and the first version came out only in 2008. It was the Abbott Diabetes Care Freestyle Navigator, and the great, great impact is only now. So that's, yes. that's the story. Spectacular achievements over a relatively short period of time. That's really something to be proud of. So that's the story. What, what else can I tell you about? Well, uh, I, I think that many of our watchers know that you have been a recipient of the National Medal of Technology and Innovation presented by the President. This is uh, quite an honor among many for you. Uh, and I think uh, the people that are watching this would be interested in 
hearing a little bit more about uh, your visit to Washington and, and the ceremony associated well, you with know, the award. It certainly was the highlight of my professional life. To be in the White House, to spend time with the President, and it's indeed pretty rare for an individual to get that medal. It's occasionally given to companies, and uh, I felt that it is absolutely wonderful considering that I come from Cluj, Romania, and passed a concentration camp. And the two are maybe related because today, at the age of 81, I'm still thinking that I need to pay for my survival. When everybody around me died and I survived, how do I pay back society for, a, for being allowed to be alive? So indeed, when we are thinking about what's next, you and I know that the Prime and I are trying to help now people with Parkinson's disease. And it's the continuation of the recognition in the White House. Now that I was allowed to survive and I was honored by the President of the United States, what can I do to pay society for this while well, I'm doing my best? Well, there's, you've done such outstanding work already. It's uh, very interesting to hear from you that you feel that there is more debt to pay. So, <clears throat> Adam, before we finish our conversation, um, of course, I know that you've seen a number of uh, changes in the field of chemical engineering, and so we would be interested in knowing a little bit about the changes that you've seen and where you think the field of chemical engineering may be headed in the future. First of all, the fundamentals of chemical engineering. You being one of the great electrochemists, Charlie Tobias having been one of the great ones, are expanding, are growing, are developing. John Prausnitz contributes as much as anybody to thermodynamics. The basics are developing, wonderful. We gain deep and new understanding. What we also see, and you've seen so well, as an associate director of Florence Berkeley Laboratory, that we are doing a huge amount of quasi-engineering that leads to nowhere, because the money exists. And that's a plague of chemical engineering, because it doesn't lead to people serving products and services. But a lot of it is politically motivated. We see huge efforts aimed at reducing carbon dioxide emissions. And it's a true tragedy that people are not taught that increased energy, energy usage, usage is associated with the growth in GDP in the world. The, gross, the, the GDP per capita has increased 20-fold in the past 30 years. So as people and governments get richer, they consume more energy. Nothing you can do to stop it. Nothing that you can do to stop it. You will not stop Asia and Africa from using more energy. I've been involved in it in recent years. And let me tell you this, that other than the rich countries, United States and Europe and Japan, nobody cares about global warming. It's not on their agenda. It's not important. Now, considering that that's the situation, and considering that we spend so much money on it, what's the alternative? Well, we don't discuss the alternative. And the alternative is thinking about means to alleviate the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere while allowing people to use carbon. And it's doable, for example, through fertilizing the southern oceans. 
but we don't, dis don't discuss it because today the greatest engineering problem in chemical engineering, global warming, is affiliated too closely with the environmental movement. And then the environment, environmental movement looks at such subjects as geoengineering, ocean fertilization, as with abhorrence, with our abhorrent by it. Very much reminds me of the debate that we had 40 years ago about HIV. 40 years ago, there were those in American society that the cause of HIV is sin and we need to stop it, the sin. And there were those who said we need drugs. Well, the same is true for carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. <laughs> you either can stop it or you can use drugs. <laughs> so where do you think our field is headed in the coming decades? Uh, chemical engineering especially, I think, has changed quite a lot in the last 30 years and it is certainly going to be continuing to change. Well, let's see some wonderful things that you see happening. You see absolutely wonderful things happening in chemical engineering, providing at the lesser cost, better materials. You see absolutely wonderful th things happening in chemical engineering, relying increasingly on natural products and converting them. You see wonderful things in electrochemistry, in shrinking down power sources, in making electrical cars the way you are doing it. And we have very, very little doubt that sooner or later we will have and I think that's in electrochemistry is the greatest challenge that I can imagine, is to have a fuel cell that first works on methane instead of hydrogen and then works on actual fuels. And you and I know that this will come. It's up to the next generation. So pretty soon we will have, with pretty soon on a historical scale, a so hundred years, there's no question in my mind that we will drive liquid fuel-based fuel cell of cars. Of course, we have many young it's, students that so, are... So the essence here is catalysis, among other things. Yes. Very deep in our understanding, build on it. So you and I as educators see many young, bright students coming through our educational system. And um, to end this conversation, I'd like to ask you uh, what you think these uh, young students should be told about entering a career in science and engineering and being successful in their careers. Uh, those few of our students who are thinkers, should think. And I'm now very serious about it because when I was mentored at, by laboratories at, by my executive director, Bill Slichter, he explained to me that I am not here to tell people what to do, but to let them think. There's nothing more important that you can do. The minute that you let them think, they go in their own way. But you and I know that the thinkers among our students are few. Maybe if I look at my own colleagues, I would certainly say fewer than one in 20 are able to think in depth about new directions. That's my impression also. So what should the rest do? The rest should think how they can bring benefit to society. And when you go to work, the toughest, 
test and whether you are bringing benefit to society is go to work for a venture because the venture will sink if it doesn't bring benefit to society. In a large, large organization you will survive even if you don't bring benefit to society. If you are in a large organization and you're giving guidance to students, I guide them to be at the fastest growing part of the company and nowhere else. Not on one of the branches that are about to die if they can. Each company has its fastest growing branch. So I like ventures. I like small companies and the big companies. I like the parts that grow most rapidly. And let me say this, nothing is more important than what we are doing is to educate the few people who can think. Well, that's valuable uh, thought and, and advice, and I think uh, we should conclude our very interesting discussion. Wonderful. It's been a great pleasure to meet with you today. And Thank I, you, my beloved friend Alton. It's such a pleasure to sit here with you and tell you stories. Thank you, Adam.